That's it. Let's pray in the Spirit together this morning. We need to stir it up today. We need to stir it up. In the name of Jesus, we cannot allow the holidays to steal our victory. We cannot allow the holidays to steal our spiritual momentum. In the name of Jesus, God, I want you today more than I want anything else. God, I'm hungry for you today. God, I'm hungry for you today. I want your presence. I want your power to be manifest in this house. Let there be deliverance in the house of God. Let there be life in the house of God. Let there be joy in the house of God. Let there be victory in the house of God today. God, this is my desire. God, this is my hunger. God, this is what I want today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That's it, believer. Stir up the gift that's inside of you today. That's it, believer. Speak to the well. Spring up, O well. Spring up, O well. Let there be life. Let there be liberty in the house of God today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. This is our hunger. God, this is our desire. God, this is what we want, Lord. We want you. You. We want your presence. Overwhelm us with your presence today. God, saturate us with your presence today. In Jesus' name. 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 Would you reach over and pray with someone? We're just going to connect together as we start this service. There's power and unity. And the Holy Ghost you have, you're going to share it with someone near you. The faith you have, you're going to share it with someone near you. That's it. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we have gathered here on purpose. We've gathered here with a mission. God, have your way in the life of every believer today, in the life of every believer, in every family today, in every home today. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's thank the Lord together for his goodness. 
Come on, if he's been good to you, that's it. If he's been good to you, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Ooh. Turn to someone near you, tell him, get ready. Say, God's going to do something special in the house today. Amen. Let's put our hands together. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. God bless you as we go into a time of worship. Hallelujah. God has been good. Amen. Hallelujah. We do enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. We're thankful unto him and we bless his name. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, let's give thanks to God. Amen. We thank God this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Wandering into the night. Wanting a place to hide this weary soul. This vagabond.
you, God. Oh, we bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so this morning. Hallelujah. We're going to sing as a family this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. For God has dealt bountifully with us. So we will sing. Amen. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Give him the fruit of your lips this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. So good. So good. Oh, with my hands lifted up. Hallelujah. Oh, we bless you, oh God. Oh, I will bless thee, oh Lord, with my hands lifted up. With my hands lifted up. And my mouth filled with prayer. And my mouth filled with prayer. With a heart of thanksgiving. I will bless thee. I will bless thee, oh Lord.
Hallelujah. Bless your name this morning. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. How many grateful people do we have? Amen. Are you the one that came back to say thank you this morning? Hallelujah. There's a story of the lepers, 10 that were healed, and only one came back to say thank you. Hallelujah. How many know scripture says he's looking for you and you and you to worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. He shouldn't have to look for us. We should be running back to say thank you because he's been so good. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Jesus. I'm grateful for all of the things you've done, done for me. You've been faithful and merciful for my sins you for.
a day of thanksgiving. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is anybody grateful in the house this morning? Can you think of what the Lord has done for you just for a few more moments, church? His mercy, His grace. We worship you this morning, Jesus. We bless your holy name. God, we come with the spirit of gratitude this morning. We're grateful. We're grateful, Lord, that you've forgiven us our sins. We're grateful, Lord, that you picked us up, uh, Lord, and put us on solid ground. Hallelujah. We're grateful, Lord, for the nails that you took, the stripes on your back, Lord. We're grateful today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. We worship you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That breath in your lungs. Hallelujah. That's a gift from God. Just take a deep breath. That's, that's God's grace. Hallelujah. I could be dead. I could be gone. Oh, but the Lord's grace and mercy found me. Hallelujah. I'm so grateful today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that grace is still working. Amen. Amen. That grace is still moving. Hallelujah. There's still souls to be saved. There's still deliverance to take place. Amen. There's still strongholds to be broken down. Hallelujah. So all together, church, we're going to step on the battlefield. We're going to pray our kingdom prayer. Let's pray for our city in faith, knowing if he did it for you, he can do it for those that are beyond these four walls. In Jesus' name, Lord, we worship you this morning. We praise you today, God, for what we feel in this house, Lord. Uh, but I pray, Father, for those that are beyond these four walls, uh, those that are bound and broken and lost, Lord, uh, that you would send your spirit in in the name of Jesus, there would be a supernatural drawing in the Holy Ghost. We plead the blood over our leaders. We plead the blood. Oh God, let the blood flow from the highest mountain, Lord, from the highest government official to the poorest beggar on the street, God. Let your mercy, God, find them in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would prepare each and every one of us as laborers for the harvest, God. Give us eyes to see in the Spirit, Lord. Give us ears to hear, to be led of the Holy Ghost in redeeming the time. For we know that the time is short. In the name of Jesus, I pray to the north, to the south, to the east, and to the west, that the principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness in high places would be brought low. Lord, I pray for every backslider, God, that they would come to themselves just as the prodigal son came to himself they would realize that it's so much better in the master's house in the name of Jesus and Lord we'll be sure to give you all the glory all the honor and all the praise Lord because it's only by your spirit God in the name of Jesus we worship you today we praise you today Lord we believe you for it hallelujah Hallelujah. I just believe it this morning, church. We don't pray this prayer in vain. Hallelujah. But this prayer, it bears fruit. Amen.
And if you've come into this house with the need of your own, you have a situation, you have a circumstance that you don't know where to go, you've come to the right place. We bring it to Jesus, hallelujah. We lay it at the master's feet and say, God, I don't know what else to do. Lord, the doctor has given me a bad report. Lord, I don't know where the finances are going to come from. Let me tell you, the Lord is a healer. You want to know why? Who's been healed in this room? Why don't you wave your hand and say, God has touched me. My Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he healed yesterday, he can heal today. If he delivered yesterday, he can deliver today. If he provided yesterday, provision is on its way in Jesus' name. So if you have a need in this house, why don't you lift up your hand in faith this morning? Church, you see the hands lifted across the building. Let's go and pray in faith together in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray this morning. I pray, Father, for every need in this house, God, every situation, Lord, every circumstance. God, I pray right now where healing is needed that you would heal, where deliverance is needed that you would deliver, God, where provision is needed that you would provide. In the name of Jesus, set the crooked paths of the mind straight, Lord. Where anxiety and depression is, Lord, that you would speak to the storms of the mind. Peace be still, Lord. There would be peace in your presence, God. In the name of Jesus. And Lord, we'll be sure to worship you for it today, God. We're believing for testimonies this morning, Lord. From this very prayer, God, that we can testify of the goodness of Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 Lord. Let your healing virtue flow this morning. Oh, God, for those that are standing in the gap for lost loved ones, Lord, that they would feel your presence. There would be a drawing in the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Church, why don't we all say that in Jesus' name. My word says, whatsoever you ask in my name and believe it to be done. Hallelujah. I'm believing for testimonies this morning. Amen. Amen. You all may head back to your seats. And please remain standing. It will be, there will be just a couple brief announcements. Acts 29, coming up this weekend, this Friday and Saturday, is our Winter Youth Revival. <laughs> guest speaker, well, not too much of a guest, but Pastor Eli Lopez will be bringing the word, amen. <laughs> December 1st and 2nd, again at the Westland campus at 7 p.m. You do not want to miss it. And all of our new visitors and guests who've been coming, who've not been able to uh, attend the new membership orientation, we want to invite you to do so this Saturday. Uh, it starts at 9. The doors open at 8.30. You can RSVP at clministry.com slash membership. This is the perfect opportunity for you to come if you have questions about what we believe and what's going on. We'll, we'll feed you as well. So there's free food. Amen. But again, this week in December 2nd, register at clministry.com slash membership. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. It is time for our Sunday morning tithe and offering. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's make our declaration together. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Upon the authority of the word of God, we declare that the Lord is our provider. As one who tithes and gives offerings, I am entitled to his blessings and protection from the attacks of the enemy. Therefore, I bring my tithe and offering into your storehouse today, knowing that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. For employees, we claim good jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, promotions and benefits, and favor with our employers and customers in the workplace. For business owners, we claim favorable contracts and growth, and that these businesses will be profitable and a blessing to the kingdom. 
For his people, the Lord shall supply income, inheritances, estates, interest, rebates, unexpected gifts and blessings. Bills and debts will be paid off, allowing me to live debt free. Since spiritual blessings follow the giver, I declare that my whole family is saved and in relationship with God. We receive perfect health, healing, deliverance, and walking in the divine favor and blessing of the Almighty. I am blessed coming in and going out, and all that I put my hand to do will prosper in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And the Lord bless you as you give this morning on the lower floor. You can march in the balcony. They will wait on you. Hallelujah. It's so good to see all of our guests and visitors. Church, why don't you stand this morning? Why don't you give them a hand? Amen. It's good to see you all. We want to invite you to our Genesis room uh, after service. That's to my right, your left in the hallway. Come have a cup of coffee. Come. There will be pastors there to answer any questions that you might have, and we would love to see you after service. Uh, church, why don't you turn, why don't you do some pew evangelism this morning, why don't you greet someone you might not know and welcome them to the house of the Lord this morning.
Hallelujah. Praise God. Is anyone glad to be in the house of God today? God is good today. Amen. Can we all stand to our feet? Amen. And we're going to pray over the word this morning. And uh, I'd like to take us to Psalm 118 today. Um, and um, very, very grateful to be here. It is an honor, it is a privilege to preach to the people of God, to the bride of Christ. Amen. It's an honor to be here. Uh, but one thing is for sure, you know, I, I, every time I share the word, I'm excited to receive it just as much as any of you. Uh, there's something about the moment of receiving that word in a service where we all partake of the goodness of the living word of God. And we're transformed by it. Amen. And so I'm very grateful today. I give honor to our pastor. How many love our pastor? Pastor Nathaniel Haney. So honored to be serving the Lord here in this ministry. Amen. And I know God is going to have his way uh, this morning. Psalm 118. I have a burden today to preach the word uh, as I have received it in my heart. And I need the Lord's help today to just communicate with wisdom uh, what the Lord has placed in my spirit, the way that he has placed it in my spirit today. So let's read Psalm 118. The word of God says here, verse 1, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say, his mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say, his mercy endures forever. Can we practice that a little bit here? And this is, I didn't plan for this, but uh, how about we say that? His mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say, his mercy endures. <laughs> I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. Hmm. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Let me say that a different way. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in presidents. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in governors. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in your bank account. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me like bees. They were quenched like a fire of thorns, for in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Wow. My God. Verse 15. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Now, one thing about this particular verse is that this is actually the verse where that song, shouts of joy and victory reside in the tents, comes from. It is connected to this very psalm. And so it says, the voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Let's pray. God, we thank you, Jesus, for your word today, Father. We thank you for your living word, God, that you send to our hearts and our minds to search us and discern the thoughts of our soul and our spirits, God. I pray, God, that you would search us today, tear down, God, 
Tear down, God, and uproot any false word. Plant and build your word, God, in our lives today. I pray, God, give us the gift of divine attention today. By the power of your Holy Spirit, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear, God. Measure back unto us our desire to know you, Jesus. Measure back to us our open ears. Koloshatabahaya. Measure it back to us, God, as we open our ears to you. Then give us the ability to hear what the Spirit has to say, God, to the church today. Father, give us a spirit of revelation and understanding as we go into your word to learn more about you and learn more about your promises. For a few moments, can you just let, set your Bible aside and let's just lift our hands and let's worship the Lord today. We love you and we praise you, God. Lord God, we praise you for you are our victory. We thank you, God, today. We thank you, Jesus, today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, let's give that hand praise to the Lord. Come on, let's give him an ovation of praise. Worthy. Worthy is the Lord, for he is our victory today. Call up, Osa. Worthy is the Lord, because he's our salvation. Thank you, God. You may take your seats in the presence of God today. Today, I want to talk to you about the power of prophetic praise. The power of prophetic praise. There are perhaps very few psalms or scriptures as prophetic as uh, Psalm 118. And uh, many times we read these psalms and we assume that they're simply praises to God. But as we journey into understanding Psalm 118, you will see that Psalm 118 is actually a demonstration of prophetic praise, of what God is doing and what God will do. And we can learn from this psalm, even as we praise God for the victory that he is giving us, and the victory that he will give us in Jesus' name. Here, the word of God, it begins in Psalm 118, inviting the people of God to give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. To give thanks to God because his mercy, his loving kindness, it endures forever. And it says, let Israel now say his mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. Now, as this psalm progresses, once we get to verse 14 and 15, uh, we see this connection. There is a connection that Psalms 118 makes with other portions of Scripture, which actually opens up our understanding of what the writer of Psalm 118 is addressing within this psalm. In verse 14, it says, The Lord is my strength and song and he has become my salvation. One thing to understand about this particular verse is that it is, does not stand alone. It is actually referencing Exodus chapter 15, verse 2. And this verse of Scripture is a song that was sung to God. It says, then Moses, in uh, chapter 15 of Exodus, then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke saying, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously the horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song and he has become my salvation. He is my God. I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. 
what this psalm is doing, it is drawing from the story that we see in the book of Exodus about the salvation of Israel from its bondage. Now, to appropriately understand what Psalm 118 is talking about, we have to remember the whole story of Israel being released from Egypt Otherwise, we will not fully grasp the kind of shouting and the kind of rejoicing that's actually supposed to be occurring in the tents of the righteous. And so it reaches back and it references this song that Moses and the people of Israel sang to God in, re in, in praise of the salvation and the fact that God set them free. You see, Egypt, they had been slaves and they had been in bondage for over over 400 years to a nation that did not know their God and did not believe in their God. That nation, that kingdom was the kingdom of Egypt. And the word of God says that Egypt bound them in chains. And actually Egypt was afraid of them multiplying. So the Pharaoh actually called on them to kill all of the male children that were born because they were afraid that Israel as a people would multiply too great great and join their enemies to destroy Egypt. And so Egypt was a cruel taskmaster. Now Egypt would require of them to build their own buildings and to create storehouses, not for the Israelites themselves, but storehouses of food for the Egyptians. There, the word of God says that there came a point in time where God heard the cry of the suffering of Israel. Israel. He heard their cry as they were in bondage. And when he remembered the covenant that he had made with a man named Abraham, then he sent a prophet named Moses. And he told Moses, I'm going to send you to Egypt because it's time for me to set my people free. It's time for me to set these people who are descendants of a man that I loved, of a man of whom I was a friend. And this man's name is Abraham and I will release them from their bondage with great signs and wonders and the word of God says that God was going to give them a memorial he was going to give them experiences of great mighty signs and wonders so that they can look back upon their story they could look back upon these events and remember the goodness of God and so the word of God says that he struck Egypt with plagues so that Pharaoh could eventually set them free. Now, this story is much more extensive than I can describe, so I'm giving you the Cliff Notes version. So the word of God says that they were released from Egypt, but Pharaoh, he repented in his heart from letting them go. God intentionally took them to the edge of the Red Sea. He took them to a place where they could no longer move forward, and they also could no longer move backward. Why? Because the Red Sea was in front of them, and the armies of Pharaoh were behind them to bring them back into slavery and bondage to bring them back to Egypt and bind them to their suffering. And so Israel asked Moses, did you bring us here to die? Why were we released from Egypt? So that we, just so that we could die at the edge of the Red Sea. And the Lord God told Moses, take that rod in your hand and stretch it forth. And when he did this out of faith, the word of God says that he parted the Red Sea. And the word of God says that the Red Sea it parted and there was like walls of water from side to side and the word of God says that they walked on dry land and let me tell you the significance of this because a lot of scholars they try to uh, write these kinds of things off and say well they passed through a part of the Red Sea that was actually very shallow water and it could have been that perhaps the water backed up and it receded enough for them to pass through the word of God says that it was walls of water on each side and if the word of God says it, guess what happened? All right. Yeah, that's right. That is exactly what happened because God, sometimes God is not interested in doing natural things to demonstrate his power. Sometimes God loves a good old fashioned miracle that no man can explain. 
right? And the Word of God said that they walked on dry land. Do you realize how detailed that is? That means the power of God went to every single grain of sand and sucked it dry of all of its moisture. I can tell you for a fact that each grain of sand had never been drier in its existence. Because it was the will of God for them to walk on dry land. And he took every water molecule from every grain of sand and he split it from the ground and he forced it to the sides. Why? Because God was giving Israel a miracle so that they can look back and remember and say, praise be to the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. And so if we go to Psalm one. 18, then we see what the psalm is talking about when it says that my enemies camped around me. The nations surrounded me. And it says that the, my enemies, they surrounded me like bees. But the Lord is my strength and song. And he has become my salvation. And so now the people of Israel cross that Red Sea and they go to Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai um, was in the Sinai Peninsula. It was a mount in which God descended. After Israel had been released from their slavery and their bondage from Egypt, they went to this mount and God descended on the mount in a great cloud. The word of God says that he spoke with thunder and lightning, as thunder and lightning, and it shook the ground that they stood on. And it was at that place that they received the commandments of the Lord, the law of God, which, was, which is righteous. They learned how to live. But see, that wasn't the will of God. It wasn't the will of God for them to stay in Mount Sinai. God was taking them somewhere. He had given them a promise. And this is where the concept of Zion comes from. Nevertheless, when they were amongst their tents and they had been released from their, uh, from their slavery, it was then that they received the joy of the Lord. They received the joy of the Lord that now inspired them to praise in the tents of the righteous. In the tents of those who were receiving the word of God, they were receiving the righteous law of the Lord. And so the word of God says that there's joy in the tents. But Psalm 118 isn't simply just talking about the experience of Israel in Egypt, but it's also looking forward in time into the future. It's looking forward to a time uh, that we will see here and we'll see the evidence of the fact that Psalm 118 was also talking about a future point in time. If we continue reading, it says, The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. Let's skip to verse 21. I will praise you for you have answered me and have become my salvation. Verse 22, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. So the word of God says here, I will praise you for you have answered me and have become my salvation. And then it begins to quote some, say something that was hundreds of years before its time. It says the stone that the builders rejected. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Now let's go. To a portion of scripture in the New Testament where this is actually quoted. I want to take you to the book of Acts chapter 4. We love you Jesus. Verse 10. Well starting in verse 10. 
Acts chapter 4, verse 10. It says, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Wow. My God. Wow. So this psalm, it stands in between different eras of time. This psalm stands between the promises of God, the prophetic receiving of the promises, and then the fulfillment of what is to come. Now, I do want to take you to another verse of Scripture uh, that talks about the promise of God. Because it seems like in Psalm 118 that they have already received that promise. They received it. The writer of one, Psalm 118 received it. But the writer of 118 received it by faith. By faith. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. I want to take you to Isaiah chapter 51. And you will begin to see themes in Isaiah 51 that relate to Psalm 118, which tells us we don't know exactly when Psalm 118 was written and if it was written before or after this scripture in Isaiah 51. But what we do know is that Theologically speaking, they're connected to each other. And what we do know is that one stands before fulfillment, and Psalm 118 stands in prophetic fulfillment. I'll explain what I mean uh, a little bit more. Isaiah 51 verse 1 says, Listen to me, you who follow after righteousness. You who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you, for I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Hmm. Listen to me, my people. And give ear to me, O my nation. For law will proceed from me and I will make my justice rest as light. Of the peoples. My righteousness is near, my salvation has gone forth, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands will wait upon me, and on my arm they will trust. Let's skip to verse 7. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, you people in whose heart is my law. Do not fear the reproach of men, nor be afraid of their insults. For the moth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool. But my righteousness will be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. Awake! Awake! Put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the ancient days, in the generations of old, are you not the arm that cut Rahab apart and wounded the serpent? Are you not the one who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, that made the depths of the sea a road for the redeemed to cross over? He's talking about walking on dry land in the Red Sea. So the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion, 
with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Verse 15. But I am the Lord your God who divided the sea, whose waves roared. The Lord of hosts is his name. And I have put my words in your mouth. I have covered you with the shadow of my hand. That my plant, that I may plant the heavens, lay the foundations of the earth, and say to Zion, you are my people. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We read Psalms 118. And now we've read two different points in time that speak about the salvation of God in two different ways. We read in Acts 4, chapter, uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 10, the fulfillment of the rock that the builders rejected. We read in Isaiah a scripture that says, this is what God will do. But we also read in Psalm 118, as if God was already doing, he was already enacting his prophetic plan. How does this work? How is it possible if Psalm 118 was written possibly hundreds of years before the book of Acts, before the apostle Peter? We have an insight in this. In Hebrews chapter 11, where it talks about the nature of faith. And it talks about how faith gives you access to the substance of things that are hoped for. And the evidence of things that are not seen. Because by faith we know that that which is seen was created by that which was not seen. And so the word of God says that even the prophets and the men of God of old, they had no idea what they were receiving but they were receiving something in their spirit that God was about to do in the future. And this is why Abraham, he walked about in a foreign land looking for a city. He was looking for Zion. He was looking for a city where God would dwell, whose builder is the Lord, the foundations whose builder is the Lord. And he was wandering the land of Canaan, even the land that God had promised him, knowing that he was was a foreigner knowing that he he did not he could not inherit that land at that moment but yet he still walked that land that was still not his as if it was his because it might have not been his at that time but he could feel by faith that he would inherit that land and the generations after him would inherit that land and he praised God for having received the promise and he praised God for having received that prophecy and he could praise God not just for something that he would do but for what God was doing already in a similar fashion the writer of 118 I can already imagine the writer under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost writing things there is rejoicing in the tents of the Lord and all of a sudden a messianic prophecy jumps upon him and he says the rock that the builders rejected and he has no idea exactly what he's writing about but he feels it in his spirit I'm talking about a savior that is to come but it's the rock, the rock that the builders rejected has come to be the chief cornerstone. Great and marvelous is this in our eyes. What does that mean? That this individual who was writing this psalm, he could see it in the spirit. He couldn't see the face of Jesus. He couldn't see the apostles. But he could see it in his spirit. And he could say, I see it, but I don't see it. Because I have not seen, nor is heard all that God has prepared for those who love them but they are revealed in the spirit for the spirit searches all things yea the deep things of God and at that moment in time the writer is searching the deep things of God 
And the writer knows, I'm not in fulfillment yet. God still hasn't given us the promise. But I can praise him as if it's already here. And I can't explain it with my mind. But I feel it in my spirit. And I feel the things that God will do. And I give him glory. I give him praise. I rejoicing is in the tents of the Lord. Why? Because he is our salvation. You see, this is, this is deep. This is more deeply connected than many times people realize because this is not the only prophetic statement about the rock that the builders have rejected. But the word of God says in verse 26 of this same psalm, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And verse 25 says, save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I want to take you to Matthew, the book of Matthew, chapter 21. The book of Matthew, chapter, I feel the Holy Ghost today. Lord, reveal it to us today, God, in Jesus' name. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. And the word of God says, Matthew 21, 8. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitude who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You know what Hosanna means? It means save, Lord. Save, save, Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are our highest Savior. We can see no other Savior but you. There is no greater Savior than the one who is riding into this city on a colt. Because the Word of God says that Jesus, he rode on a colt into, he rode on a donkey into Jerusalem. And as he was coming in, the multitude began taking off their clothes and throwing it on the ground and saying, Hosanna. Savior, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. I want to take you to another occasion. It's not a second one, but it describes the same event in a little bit of a different way. The book of Luke chapter 19. Is this all right to have a Bible study a little bit? Amen. The book of Luke chapter 19, verse 37. <clears throat> Luke 19, 37. Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Hallelujah. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Whew. My God. My Lord. You know, okay. <clears throat> uh, I do believe that it's possible that the stones could have cried out. Why? Because the mountain of Mount Sinai, it trembled and it roared at the presence of God. And because the presence of God was in the man, Christ Jesus, on earth. If there were not people to praise him, creation itself would get so frustrated and full of pressure that the rocks would begin to cry out and tremble for the praise of God. And you see what they were accessing, even in the book of Luke, they were accessing this prophetic praise because it is the same prophetic spirit that was on the writer of Psalm 118 that said, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And he began praising the Lord in a psalm. And that same spirit was on these people who had seen the great deeds of Jesus Christ. And they could not help but praise him. They couldn't help but give him the glory because they were feeling on the inside of them something mysterious. It's something 
something powerful that I cannot define with my mind, but I know it in my spirit. What is it? That the Lord is worthy of praise. That the Lord is worthy of the glory. There's something in me that needs to say, blessed, blessed, blessed. And God was in them. The Spirit of God was in them. It was forcing them to give God the praise. Church, isn't that what we feel sometimes when we're praising God in this place? We feel like it's not even that I want to praise Him anymore. I need to praise Him. And if I don't praise Him, I feel like the benches are going to cry out. I feel like the building's going to shake with glory. I have to release the pressure of prophetic praise because there's something on the inside of me there's something that's pushing out and i gotta give him the glory and we begin to run the aisles and begin to praise god until our legs give out we praise god until our voice gives out why because if i don't praise the rocks are gonna cry and the power of god is so powerful in this place I gotta give him the glory. I just have to. I have to give him praise. This is this is what people feel when they get quickened in the spirit. It's like God touches them and something weird happens, something abnormal happens. You gotta praise him. You gotta run. You gotta give him glory because you're feeling. You're feeling that spirit that says, blessed is he. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Praise him higher. Praise him greater. Praise him. Oh, can we give God an ovation right now and just give him the glory? Give him the glory. Worthy. Worthy, worthy, and my soul knows it, God. Worthy, worthy, worthy. I need to praise you. I need to praise you. I got to give you the glory. I got to give you the glory. I got to give you the glory. Hey, God. Oh, God. Hey, hey. How did I, how did I receive this message? How did I receive this message? I knew that this was going to be the next message. That the Lord was going to give me the chance, the opportunity to preach to you all months ago. And I somehow something in me knew that this was the very next thing that I would be preaching some time ago. How did I receive it? When did I receive it? I was in my office. I was listening to those songs. Shouts of joy. Shouts of joy. And victory resound in the tents. Righteous. And I was thinking, I know this is prophetic. Every time we sing it, it's like something prophetic enters into the building. And many of us don't understand why, because we don't quite understand the connections in Scripture. But we are seeing why. And God is shaken and he's moved by that song in a very unique way because it is connected to prophetic Scripture. Shouts of joy. And victory resound in the tents. And I was listening to the, to the song and I was reflecting on the song in my office. And then I felt in me the prompt of the spirit. I got up from my desk and I started marching around my office. Shouts of joy and victory in the tent. And then I started feeling the desperation to praise. And I started feeling, feeling, feeling. Shouts of and victory resound and it started getting bigger and greater and greater and I said God why I felt in my spirit God why why is this so prophetically powerful and then I felt the Lord tell me this is powerful and the story of the Israelites is so important 
Because the message is this. If I can do it with Israel, if I can save them from their slavery, and if I can wash them of their sins, though their sins may be scarlet, I, I can wash it white as wool. And if I can save them from a desperate situation where they were doomed to destruction, that means that I can save you. That means that I can redeem you. That means that I can take you out of where you are. And I said, shouts of joy and victory resound. And, the, and I said, the tents, the tents, the tents, the tents. And then I heard the Lord say that if I can save a nation, if I can save a nation because I gave a promise to one man named Abraham, what do you think I can do to a city called Stockton? And indeed, we look at Stockton and we say, can these dry bones live? I understand that the dry bones is talking about the regathering of Israel, but that's the very point because Israel will always, they were always supposed to be a symbol, a symbol of God's glory and mercy so that the nations could ask and say, who is your God? That the nations would be glad and they would gather because the house of the Lord shall be called a house of prayer, not just for Israel, but for all nations to come and inquire of the Lord. So that is why it is very important for us to understand Israel. And in fact, I need to say this. I feel desperate to say this. That is why it's very important that we take the correct position on Israel even today. It is, it is in. It is prophetically important. And if you know anything about the Old Testament, you do not want to go against Old Testament types about what God is going to do in the future. It is a deathly thing for you, for anyone, to go against or resist the existence of Israel. Because the promises of God is for Israel. And he is still in a journey of fulfilling his promises that he made to one man. Abraham and because he loves Abraham he must be faithful to the promises that he gave Abraham about his descendants for you to go against that is for you to go against God you cannot and you should not do that and can I tell you Israel today not only has a right to exist they also have a right to exist in that land in that land it can be no other way there is no other option. Why? Because God is faithful to his promises. And if God is faithful to a nation named Israel that is under constant attack by its enemies, we can look at our lives and say that God can be faithful in Stockton, California. He can be faithful. And though we look around our city and we see dry bones, we see slavery, we see darkness, we see death. It's time for us to prophetically say, shout for joy and victory reside. And why? So I was in my office and I was feeling it and I was feeling and I was feeling the presence of God. And the Lord said, can these dry bones live in Stockton, California? And I began to praise God because they did live. And I began to praise God, not for revival, but because God did give us revival. And I'm not talking about God did now, but somehow I felt it in the future. I felt something that was going to happen. And I began to praise God. And as I began to praise God in my office, I began to praise God for every soul that was going to come to this altar and receive the Holy Ghost. I don't know how to explain it, but it, it's as if I was them. It's as if it's, I, I was the one praising and praising God for every family and every backslider that was going to come to the church, come back to the house of God. And I began to praise God for God setting me free. And it's not that God was setting me free. It's that I was feeling that God was setting somebody else free I was prophetically praising for all the sinners that were going to come to the house of God 
And I imagined, I imagined the whole sanctuary filled with people. And I imagined sinners expanding in, in the balcony. And I imagined them singing this song and saying, shout for joy and victory resound in the tents. Why? Because God had touched them and God had set them free. And I began to see them in this altar lifting up their hands. Kind of like how we see individuals here today. I'm sorry for calling you out, but it's kind of like me looking looking at Luke Selinda and seeing the fact that him just a few years ago didn't know who God was but somehow God redeemed him and now he shouts for joy because victory is in his tents victory is in that temple of God and can I tell you Luke we were already praising on your behalf before you even knew him we were already prophetically praising and praying for you we were already praying for your salvation we were already praying for you to be set free and we praised God prophetically because we knew that that prophetic praise would somehow turn into manifestation and the Lord began to move on in my office and I began praising I had to take off my jacket I had to take off I had to check, I had to untuck my, my shirt, I had to take off my tie because I began to get drenched with sweat because the Holy Ghost was on me and I was praising God for what would happen. And then God told me about the promises that he had given me and he asked me, can these dry bones live, man of God? And he began to take me through my promises and I decided in that moment uh, to not challenge the promises of God but sing shout for joy and victory resound in the tents because I just knew that I knew that I knew that God would have his way and that God will fulfill all of his promises and I began to run around my little office it's maybe 20 feet long and I began to run circles around that office why because I could feel it in my spirit that I was praising him for something that he was about to do and that is exactly what I'm trying to share to you church today there is a reason why God moves so powerfully not just with that song but other songs that talk about victory it's because sometimes something gets on the inside of you and you just can't understand it and you may be singing with a microphone and you may be playing with your bass but somehow there's something prophetic that's happening when you play those drums and all people hear is cymbals but what you're saying is that there is victory in the house of God. There's victory in the house of God. And the church begins to move. And the church begins to praise. But it gets to a moment where it's no longer about the music. It's about what God is doing through us. We're celebrating the victory of our God. We're celebrating the victory of Jesus Christ. And we enter into a plane that's much higher than just praise in general. We enter into a plane of faith where we praise Him for everything that will happen. And for a moment then we're able to touch. We're able to touch the victory. Not just of revival for Stockton. We're able to touch the victory of prophetic fulfillment even in the book of Revelation. We're able to touch the victory of Jesus coming on a white horse who is written on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We begin to see him riding and coming down from heaven. And we begin to praise God. Not because it's happening now, but it's as if it was happening now. I wish we would experience more of that. I wish we would experience more of that kind of praise. Can I tell you that that's exactly the kind of praise that God wants his people to feel. That's the kind of praise. That's exactly what we feel when we say the Lord is moving through a song. The Lord is moving. We feel that dominion, that prophetic power of God. And it's not just us singing about gratitude anymore. It changes into something else that I can't put my mind on. But the Lord wants us to do it. The Lord wants us to do it. The Lord wants us to do it. The Lord wants us to feel it. Can we stand to our feet today? The Lord wants us to feel it. 
before, we know not how to, we don't know how to pray as we ought. For the Spirit prays through us with utterings, with uh, groanings that cannot be uttered. Because the Spirit knows the will of God. For we do not, do not know how to praise as we ought. But when the Spirit begins to pray through, praise through us. For we don't know how to worship as we ought. But when the Spirit begins to worship through us, it begins to worship with groanings that cannot be uttered. Why? Because you may think that God is good, but you have no idea how good God is. As soon as you think God is good, He's already more good than your revelation and understanding. <clears throat> and that's why without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to even praise Him. Because up until a certain point, you can only praise Him for what you know Him to be. But when you praise Him prophetically, you are praising Him for the great I Am that He is that cannot be defined. And you cannot pinpoint the greatness. And that's why I sometimes I just can't say it with my mouth. I have to say it with my hands. I have to say it with my feet. I have to say it with my tongues. Why? Because I'm touching praise that's greater than my mind. And I'm worshiping God. Church, can we just do this? that for a few moments right now just lift your hands and lift your voice and worship your God come on and lift up your voice and give him that praise Come on, somebody praise him in the tents. Somebody praise him in the tents of the Lord. The tents of the righteous. Somebody give him the glory because he's worthy. Somebody enter in to that kind of praise that says, God, I know you're already doing it. I know you're already fulfilling your promises in the spirit. I want to invite somebody to begin praising God for your backslidden children. I want somebody to begin praising God for your backslidden family. I want you to begin praising God for revival in this city. I want you to begin praising God for all those who will come to the house of God and be saved. You see, they can't praise God, but you can praise God for them. You can praise God in their stead. You can praise God prophetically. You can give God the kind of glory that they will give when they're in the house of God. Somebody praise Him. Come on up to the front. Don't block the center. Come on up to the front. Come on up. Come on up. Make some space here. Is anybody desperate to praise the Lord today? Does anyone feel the desperation? Uh, Hosanna in the highest. Uh, blessed is he that comes. Blessed is he that comes. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the Lord Almighty. You don't even have to come to the front. You can do it wherever you're at. Wherever you're at, you can raise your hands and you can begin to give him the glory. You be can begin to praise him and say, God, I praise you because you're doing it. I praise you because you're worthy. I see the fulfillment of the, your promises. I see, I see, I see. And I praise you today. And I give you the glory today. I give you the glory today. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. As the praise team comes, somebody give him the glory. As the praise team comes, somebody praise him for victory in your life. Praise him for victory in your future. Praise him for the victory that he will give you today. Come on, somebody give him glory. 
Come on, somebody give him glory. If God is faithful to Israel, he's going to be faithful to you. If God can save Israel, he can save you. He can save you. He can save you. He can transform you.